remarkably, the 70 AD destruction is exactly on the same day, mm. the fire, at the, at the same day that the Babylonian temple is destroyed. Jews get real nervous around that time of year because throughout the Inquisition, many places there have been radical, uh, heavy uh, disasters that hit Jews during that time. Reggie, Reggie yeah. that, that witness is taking place during the first three and a half years? Yeah, now that witness carries on through, of course. Sure. Sure. But yeah, that is the time before the, the overflowing scourge comes through, before the trotting underfoot. It's that time between the time when they've entered into the covenant with death and hell, in this case, in verse 23, after the league. Now there will be, there will be a, a, a witness of protest to them that, that, they have, uh, you know, that they have entered into a deadly peace covenant that's going to blow up on them. The, the scripture, Isaiah 28, does it deal with what happens? Is there a witness going forth before the covenant is made, warn, warning them? Could be, not, pretty, not, probably not is, but it. probably is. But here, the, 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 the what setting, is Isaiah 28, uh, Isaiah 28 uh, <clears throat> verse 9. Just so that's another thing, but yeah. they try to anesthetize themselves. And the next chapter, Isaiah 29, Joanna says that the that the drunkenness is spiritual. So it kind of helps you con you know, the con okay. and, and it's and, and it might even be physical because what it is is saying the prophets can't bear. they they can't endure the vision. It's more than they can handle. So they try to uh, anesthetize themselves. Yeah, you will. You, you will. But remember, it can't be the Assyrian invasion. The Assyrians never set foot. They never trod underfoot the city. And all the things that the commentators are saying, you just can't take it all. Because yeah, it, it talks about doctrine. It talks about the milk the milk, and weaned from the milk. The very language we get in the New Testament about the, the, milk, meat, the milk meat analogy with the word comes directly from there. On the website, there's you know? 45 minutes if you go into detail of Isaiah 28 from uh, Brian's... The, the meeting of Brian's house. Oh, you put that up. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so Isaiah 28 is there kind of, you know, developed. We get we really get into that, some brothers do there. Uh, but listen, let's hold this timeline together. So from 23 to 30, and Travis is going to talk to us about the very incredible significance of what, what happens between verse 30 and 31 is transitional. It happens both on earth and in heaven. But verse 31 is the abomination that starts the last three and a half years. Why would this be in 165 B.C.? And then one chapter over, it tells you there's 1,290 days between this event and the resurrection of Daniel. doesn't make sense. So even if you were to allow for some kind of prototypical fulfillment, it certainly wasn't exhausted in anything in antiquity. You had analogies, but where do you not have analogies? You have analogies with the Jerusalem in 70 A.D., but that doesn't exhaust. You know, the, so anyhow, so from 31 to 45, you have the doings of the Antichrist during the last... The last half, and uh, again, look just quickly. Look down to um, the, the frequent mention of the word "holy covenant." And here's what's significant: in verse 30, uh, 31, we see the abomination. The very next verse, thirty-two, it shows that the people that know their God are being strong and doing exploits. Now, it's through cumulative evidence to be sure, but we believe a real case could be made that something tremendous has transitioned in the heavens that is allowed now not only for the two witnesses to receive great anointing, but for the masculine to be greatly empowered. And, and I believe at this time it's significant, it's not accidental, that the very next verse after the abomination, which is the revelation of the mystery of iniquity on earth, we'll see that in 2 Thessalonians 20, the very next verse, the people of God are waxing strong and doing exploits and instructing many. And 12.3, which we didn't look at a while ago, shows they're turning many to righteousness. This is that last <coughs> harvest of souls greater than any man can number that's coming out of the tribulation. It's because of this message. This message is going to eventually have success. Not through flesh and blood, not by might or by power, but by His Spirit. The world's going to hear what you guys or a little cluster of you are hearing around this table right now. Or you've not heard it, but it, what we're reviewing together. So now, now just uh, verse 35. And some of them of understanding shall fall to test them. This doesn't mean apostasy there will be apostasy but not of those that understand they're regenerate the elect would be deceived if it were possible not because they're smart but because they're the elect Did not because they know a lot martyrdom? Martyrdom, yeah. this is martyrdom brothers I, I just want you to know i keep hearing people say the uh, the uh, the uh, uh wise will fall away uh, yeah sure they're, they're not falling away they're falling in death that's important to notice because uh we have to purify the test. Now, that's the same language you're going to see again 
in uh, chapter 12. It's ridiculous to put that into a second century fulfillment. But here's the verse I want you to see, and we're going to do one more thing and conclude our time. Thing. Verse uh, 36, And the king shall do according to his will, exalt himself, magnify himself above God, speak marvelous things against the God of God, and shall prosper till the indignation, used in many scriptures as the end, uh, shall be accomplished for that which is determined shall be done. Now look at verse 37, the next verse. Neither shall he regard the God or gods of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall, here's what I'm after, magnify himself above all. Now if you'll turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse 4 and you'll see Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica, Christ can't come right now. Christ isn't here yet. The day of the Lord cannot come until this man shows up first. Don't you remember when I was with you, I told you about this guy? And now you know why the day of the Lord can't come. He's got to come first. Now you know. I reminded you. And so he basically, in verse 4, you can see the exact same language. So when you're at home or wherever you are with your church or wherever, show people. Get some little foldouts or something and show these verses right next to each other or get them to look at it in the Bible. You'll, it, you can't speak about these things in the abstract. You've got to have an open Bible. It's certainly better that you do. So if you show them verse 4 of 2 Thessalonians 2, they're hard-pressed to say it's not the same guy you have here in verse 36. Well, this is the same guy that just a few verses above put the abomination. See, You see how we're building this case? It's airtight. You've got to leap logic. You've got to say... Uh, Jesus came mystically back in 70 A.D., or, yeah. or the resurrection didn't happen at that time, or, and it's all right here. Bridget, it's very helpful if you if you just take starting in 1121, mm -hmm. and from there with the vile person, you just track he 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 yeah, he that's what him, him. Does. I yeah. mean, just track it so that you can just I can show people. Look, and that's this, the handout we have. Yeah, we have this that person handout. does not change; he stays the same. So, no matter where you have your Bible, you get it. Now, one last point, and we'll be done with the, the main point, but then we'll open it up for things. In Daniel 9, which is where we've been wanting to get back to, in Daniel 9, you have the covenant context. In Daniel 9, verse 4, the God, the, the God, the covenant keeping God. Now, Daniel very doesn't use that word covenant except uh, in Daniel 9, and he uses it a couple times we just saw in Daniel 11. But now, if that holy covenant is future, and in Daniel 11, it's the, it's the vile person who comes against it. Then this is an assault against the, what's called the Holy Covenant. It completely repudiates the view that Israel's not still in covenant with God. Not only are they still in covenant with God, when you assault their land and scatter that people, or divide that land, it's an affront against God's covenant that right. still stands with them. That's now right. that covenant is not exactly the same as the everlasting covenant. It's, it really, put it this way, it belongs to the everlasting covenant. Yeah. But the everlasting covenant is more specific. Good. It is in fact the new covenant. Now Dan, uh, Jeremiah calls it the everlasting covenant in Jeremiah 32.40. <clears throat> but he also calls it the new covenant in Jer Jeremiah 31.31. 31. You know that. But see Ezekiel and Isaiah... And all the other prophets kept using that term, everlasting covenant. And in every place, they always meant a time on this earth when every Jewish person, every man, woman, boy, and girl, because even their children and their children's children after them would all receive the Spirit. Right. And without the exception, they would all be righteous. Yeah. Now, here's what's interesting. They're not in new bodies yet. They're in the millennium. They're building houses. They're having children. And for 1,000 years... This people are preserved in a righteousness because the law is inside their hearts. You, they enter that millennium in such a broken, contrite di di condition that they don't forget. Mm. And they abide. That doesn't mean they're perfect. The Scripture speaks, speaks about a sin offering. But it means that they have the Holy Spirit. Their sons and daughters are prophesying. For a thousand years, they are witnesses to the nations. Mm. Now, in the nations, there is massive salvation. When the Jews come back, Paul says, if, if their fall has been all of this to the Gentiles, wait till you see their return. It's going to be like a quantum leap. And so now there's massive salvation going on. Swords and beat the plowshares, the word of the Lord going out of Jerusalem, ten men of every nation. I could go on and on. The Jewish people, you know, the abundance of the sea will be converted to them. Boy, you ain't seen nothing yet. When I tell people that are into missions, if you're into missions, you're into Israel's return. Because the, the, the exponential increase... Of, of, of the waters of the uh, sea covering the earth waits for their reinstatement back to their place. You know, when the bride comes home, so to speak. So here's the point. 
in the millennium, there'll be those though, under the rod iron rule. Not everybody will yield willing, voluntary compliance. Many, many will. Many will count it a privilege to help Jews go home, even from places to which they fled during the time of Antichrist. But in the nations, Aunt Betty may not know the Lord while Uncle Buck does. But here's the great anomaly. Here's the burning bush of open witness. This covenant that's waited so long is going to be so uh, concretely vindicated by people who all know him from the least to greatest. It says in many, many places they're all righteous. Not only did they begin in the millennium all righteous, but, the, but every one of their children are taught the Spirit is upon them and upon their children. What's God saying? God is saying that when I call a people and elect a people, I'm able to have that people. Go back now to Numbers 14 when he said, Moses, step aside. He wanted to, you know, Moses says, no, if you, if you don't bring that people in. So the very people that God brought out, he can't go to another people. You can't have him. It's got to be that people. So Israel is preserved in the physical body of the flesh for one reason, not to give them any superiority, but to be an open, tangible demonstration, an incarnation, an embodiment, if you will, of God's ability to bring his people and keep his people forever. Now, he does that for a thousand years, and then we move into the new heaven and new earth. But the new heaven and new earth cannot come without the open vindication that lasts a thousand years of this everlasting covenant. After two days, you know, I'm going to go away, I'm going to hide my face, and I'm coming back when you're in affliction, when you're in travail, and you're going to acknowledge your offense, you're going to look upon me. After when? After two days. The third day, that's that thousand years, you're going to live before me as a living nation in my sight. And when they come up, they don't go back down. They're no more a covenant jeopardy threatening. Oh, if you, you know, because the remnant was never enough. You've got to keep this word in mind, the inadequacy of a remnant. God is interested to bring in. The reason all Israel has to be saved is because if it wasn't, they'd be prone to backslide and, and go back into exile. Because remember, the remnant would have to go down and suffer with the rest of the nation. So what will keep and preserve Israel in the land forever? You've got to have a, a condition fulfilled that does, does not threaten a return to exile, a return to judgment. That condition is the, is the everlasting covenant as the prophets understood it. When Paul says, and so then all Israel shall be saved, he has these verses and this covenant in mind. Now that covenant has come to us in Christ, through the atoning work of Christ. And we now have an advanced insight into the, into the mystery that they will then see. So what is still sealed from them is open to us. Isaiah 8 said, it's, it's, it's just known to my disciples. We belong to the king. But at that day, they will all know. And so this is why everlasting righteousness comes in in two places. It comes in here at the end of the 59th week at the cross. But for Israel, it comes in here where they all know him. So it's, you go to the full 77. So what's going on here? The mystery of godliness is fulfilled here. You've got the whole gospel. <coughs> You've got Genesis 3.15, the two seeds. The seed of the woman comes to full climactic you know, uh, incarnation in, in the, you know, great is the mystery of godliness, manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16. Now, why is it seven years over here? This is the mystery of iniquity here. And bring, this is the prince that shall come. He's the one that confirms the covenant. Now, we just, I, I labored to have you read there where he magnifies himself, right? Mm -hmm. Who is the, the key to the, to the argument? And there is a, you always expect a big, smoke and argument over anything that's, that the devil's threatened by. Mm -hmm. So be, be patient and wait through the arguments and keep on seeking the Lord for the truth. Don't just sign off and leave it to the experts. God doesn't want the experts to have it. He wants you to have it. It's for you. And so here's the thing. They say that, that Christ was the one that confirms the covenant. And the problem with that is the same one that confirms the covenant takes away the daily sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But see, the daily sacrifice... We see it here as part of an abomination because when the abomination, see, see the thing that is the praetors put, or the amillennialists too, they put the daily sacrifice as being taken away here when it ended up being offered another 40 years. The sacrifice was not removed until, well, listen, let me cut to the chase here. What you want to see is whoever the prince is that, that shall come, that takes away the sacrifice, he's the one that magnifies himself. See, we just saw here how the one that places the abomination is the one that magnifies himself. If you turn to Daniel uh, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 11, it's this little horn, this wicked prince, this king of fierce countenance that exalts himself. It says he takes away the daily sacrifice. So one of the laws of interpretation is you don't impose something when everywhere else in the book of Daniel, I think there's about four other places, when it's the wicked self-exalting prince 
Why, why are you going to make Daniel 9 the one exception and have Jesus taking away the sacrifice? Now, did Jesus finish the sacrifice, the typological? Yeah, and he, and he accomplished it uh, uh, once and for all. But uh, that's not what it's talking about. I'm well, kind of losing myself. But here's what you want. You don't really need more than this, and you could figure it out if you just keep this one thing in mind. Whoever the prince is that will take away the sacrifice, he's also the one that confirms the covenant, and he's got to be the one that exalts himself. Just remember that one thing, and you'll figure the rest out easily. And so, but then you'll see. That, so you'll see what hanky panky's going on when they try to put the sacrifice back over here. We're talking about a sacrifice that is is back to back, piggyback with the abomination. Right. Now, their their theologians want to keep the abomination for 70 A.D. and put the daily sacrifice taken away back over here in 30 A.D. Right at the cross. Can't do it. Because when the abomination is placed, the daily sacrifice is at the same time taken away. Because the 1,290 days to, the, to Daniel's resurrection, which is yours and mine res resurrection, is as much from the daily sacrifice being removed as it is from the abomination. And you can't break all this stuff up. So you go to, you go to uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, you're showing the same antichrist that you have here is there. God's people aren't going to be gathered together, like Jesus said. Paul uses the very same language of Jesus. He says, gathering together. After that tribulation, there's going to be a trumpet and, and I'm going to gather together my elect. Paul says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord and our, and, uh, and our gathering together unto him. It's the same language. Let no man deceive you. Don't, don't buy it that he can come now or that he's already here. The day of the Lord cannot come till this man comes first. That's right. and, when, and, 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 and only Christ, by his personal return, the brightness of his mouth, when the seventh angel sounds. No, it's, it's everywhere. So you guys, you'll, you'll, if you'll just use this simple outline... Take time, make it personal, make it your own. You can really show friends some basic things that compared together all adds up. And, you know, if, if people are a little divided over trumpets and vile, don't, don't sweat that, you know. Uh, just enjoy the fact that we need to be ready for things that are going to be open and visible that's going to move us to a place in God. And so when you come to this uh, Revelation 12, Satan coming down and all that. Just remember Daniel 12, Revelation 12. And so uh, this isn't really together, but you guys can work it out. With, if you draw these little lines and check and go back and forth, compare a scripture with scripture, you're going you're gonna to work your way right out of notions of pre-tree of raptures and, and 70 AD fulfillments. You're going to work yourself right into the basic outline of this vision. And when you know the time and you know these events, you'll be then in a position to be deeply impacted and processed this is not the whole gospel. It's not intended to be. It's just sort of a, a straightening device which keeps you on track and keeps you from being running off to a desert place for some private rendezvous with, a, with an anointed leader or whatever. Jesus said, I have told you all things. Yes. But remember, the one that said I've told you all things sends you to Daniel. If you'll use this simple outline, you know, I think it'll keep you on track and, and save you not all error, but most a lot of error for end time stuff. And we have a, a beautiful electronic version of this timeline that Tom Quinlan made uh, oh, good. two years yeah, ago. I need to see that. Huh? Pardon me? You, you know when I'm best with this stuff? Not like this. It's when I'm talking to an 18-year-old black kid just the other day. He completely got it. You know, and, you know I, just, I just, this is stuff that is not in scholar zone. Now, I know their thought, and I can deal with those guys. But well, and they're inconsistent because some things are spiritualized and some things are literal, and, you know, they have to constantly change that. The, the Mount of Olives splitting, for instance, I mean, they can't say that that was... Oh, yeah, see, I, I, I consider this like a plumb line. Every time they come in with stuff, I would almost, if we had time to experiment, I could invite you guys to try to just, not that you believe it, but just come up with stuff. And I could show you time and time again, no, it's cut off there, it's cut off there. If you keep this simple timeline, I didn't do it all that well. I want to work this out and maybe present it later a little more together. But if you keep this simple timeline and make these connections and draw lines and, and see where the same language and the same verse is saying, you're cutting off that stuff. There's nothing, there's nothing you can do about it except just to go, you know, people just get weary and they want to believe what they want to believe. But if somebody's hungry... You can keep them on track so that when they read these books and hear these pastors and other things, they won't be easily moved. You know. So we want to make this plain up on tables. And I, I went down the other day to, uh, well, Tom and I, we went down for the sole purpose. He took his whole vacation for us to work out some visuals on this. 
But when we got there, it was once in a lifetime. Dalton was in Kansas. Next thing you know, Brian, we're all down there having a big thing with Joel Richardson. And we're on a panel and I'm doing a bunch of stuff at IHOP. So it was glorious. our time, it was glorious, <laughs> but our time was completely consumed. So we're still waiting for the visuals. So if some of you guys have aptitude with computer, you can image stuff. We want to, uh, Brother Bill Nordstrom just sit by me. He said, we need uh, a timeline, but... Uh, and I suggested maybe columns so you could put scripture references in there. And wouldn't it be cool if you could put your cursor and the scriptures would pop up so that when you're dealing with your day of the Lord, like over here, can't, can't, <laughs> Tom, when you're dealing with the day of the Lord right over here, you're, you're like pouring in all the, col you know, in this column, you're putting all the verses. Now, some of these verses may apply, you know, in other places, but under each place along the chronologic, you've got, you've got scriptures. So you'll start to see, oh, yeah, Ezekiel 39 goes right with this. So, you know, and it's, all, it's all piled in. Uh, and here's something we could also give you guys. It's, this is very incomplete, but it's, uh, there's the two comings. Each of these little circles, I use two pepper shakers, or salt pepper. And then there's a, uh, then there's a uh, you know, there's the diaspora of the Jews between, you know, the, the two days of God's hiding his face from Israel, all that kind of stuff, the curses to some measure being always you know, on Israel. Then you have the, the Christ at the right hand of God, the session of Christ. Then over here you have the millennium, just stuff like that. What, what ends up happening is you see that this is all totally foretold in the Old Testament. And it's like when Jesus comes and the revelation comes at Pentecost, the whole thing pops open. So the only thing the early church didn't have, the only thing, is some of these finishing touches from Daniel. They had this basic construct. Don't let anyone tell you that they didn't expect the full futurity of the seven, seven years. That's not John Nelson Darby's invention. I can show you where Lactantius told the, the Roman Christians this can't be the Antichrist because the ten kings have got to come. Uh, uh, Hippolytus and others talk about the full seven years. A whole bunch of them talk about the last three and a half years. So this is not a dispensational invention. This is right from the Word of God, and the early church knew it. They just probably didn't expect uh, an age to go from the destruction of Jerusalem all the way to another rebuilding, uh, you know, a return. And uh, that was kind of hidden, perhaps. You know, I don't know. Pa Paul looks like he looked for a long time. But some of them talk like they looked for a very short time. 